I'm recording. Okay, and I'm going to open it up now. So now we're broadcasting. So good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us today. Um, we'll be starting in a few minutes, but I just want to, this is stuff that's upcoming at the library. Um, next week we have um, um, Fire Smart Landscaping with uh, UC Marin Master Garden and Marine Arlock. We also want to thank the Friends of the Library, the UC Master Gardeners, and the Commons Foundation for helping us put this together. And don't forget summer reading started. I know all you gardeners are reading books, so we're having adult summer bingo. You can download a bingo card. It reads outside the box this summer. Um, you can uh, visit our homepage and look for the summer reading um, signs, and you can download a, a, bing, a, a bingo card. We also have lots of other virtual programming we're starting to get set up. And if you have any little ones, on Thursday um, the 11th, we have our first virtual program with the Circus of Smile. So let your friends know, let your little kids know. We'll be doing our first virtual workshop, so, or performance anyway. And don't forget to follow us on our social media. We post all the time on our Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. We currently have some PBS programming that is live streaming on our Facebook. Um, so keep an eye on our event calendar and our calendars for those. And if for some reason you have to jump off this call today, we are recording. Um, so this will be posted to the library's YouTube channel. Um, and again, if you have questions today, um, make sure you can use the Q&A box, which is on the bottom, and the, or the little chat box, and I'll be reading the questions to Joe um, throughout the, the process today. Good morning, everybody. We'll still give it a few more minutes as people log in. Um, thank you for joining us today. I'm Franklin Escobedo. I'm the library director of the Larkspur Library. We'd like to welcome you to our, I think it's, this is our third, third one, Joe, or? Yes. <laughs> our third garden talk. Um, so today we're here for summer vegetables, um, so, summer vegetable gardening. Um, Again, we, um, next week, um, we have Fire Smart Landscaping with UC Marin Master Gardener Marie Narlock. And again, we want to thank the Friends of the Library, the UC Master Gardeners, and the Commons Foundation for helping to make this possible. And summer reading has begun, so visit our homepage to download the bingo cards, sign up your grandchildren, and we have a Beanstack app that can um, you can 
participate in activities online and children and teens can keep track of their reading online this year. Again, don't forget to follow us on the library social media. Um, on our Facebook page, we are partnering with PBS Books for uh, programs throughout the summer. So keep an eye on our calendars for events. And again, if you have for some reason have to jump off this call, um, we are recording. Um, so this um, whole um, workshop today will be posted later on today on the, the library's YouTube channel. And if you have questions, um, don't forget to use the Q&A box or in the chat. And then I'll be relaying the questions to Joe. Okay, so um, thank you everybody again. Um, again, I'm Franklin Escobedo. I'm the, Larks, the library director for the Larkspur Library. And we're here today with um, Master Gardener Joe Jennings, who's also the president of the Commons Foundation. And um, Joe is here today to share, us, um, share with us and how to get our own summer vegetable gardens going. So I'm gonna hand this over to you, Joe. Hi everyone, I'm so glad you came. Um, as uh, Franklin said, uh, this class, um, the, the idea is what's going on right now in the summer garden. Um, I'm using um, pictures from this morning from my own garden. There's a little video clip I hope we can make work. Um, and the goal is to uh, deal with where are we right now with our vegetable garden and then things we can do as we go into the summer to add new things or to address the issues. Um, we, the questions um, I get the most often about vegetable gardening uh, is, is it too late to fill in the blank? Or something's not working, can I start over? Or wow, that's a lot of, and, then, and now what? Or what's next? So we'll be answering these questions as we go. Um, I'm a UC Master Gardener. Now we're part of the UC Cooperative Extension Office. We're volunteers who go to a class for half a year and then go out and work in the community, exchanging information that is generated in the horticulture schools in the UC system. And then we try and make it so that civilians and normal people like you and I can understand it and use it. Now we have a website, you can call us. Our help desk is unfortunately still closed. But if you have an issue, you can email helpdesk at marinmg.org and they'll respond to you. Um, as I said, I live in Marksburg. I'm a UC Master Gardener and I teach tomato, vegetable, and citrus tree gardening. Um, by the way, this is my first ladybug of the season, which was a couple weeks ago growing on a um, sunflower plant. So um, I'm very excited about that. So um, before we start, uh, vegetable gardening basically boils down to you need six hours of sunlight a day. You need to grow the soil because that's what grows the plants. You need to protect before you plant because we're in habitat here and there's things that will eat everything you grow before you will. You should plant what you eat and you should plant with access water harvesting and cleanup and sunlight all in mind when you do this. So I want to see, I, um, I want to sh share something that I uh, created this morning and I hope this works. Now I'll be doing the voiceover to this because the sound wasn't very good, but this is from the garden this morning. Um, what you're seeing behind me to my left is um, the zucchini plants. Now the zucchini plant, um, were planted from starts in um, first of April. And this is the biggest set of zucchini plants I've ever had. They're huge. Uh, what's interesting is the flowers have all come in uh, very nicely, but I'm seeing a lot of ants. I don't think the ants will hurt the plant, but they're there. This is scarlet runners, also planted from seed April 1st. They're about uh, eight feet tall now and going. Um, this is one of these mammoth sunflowers. Uh, my only mistake was I planted this right at shelter in place by seed, and I planted it on the wrong side of the tomato plants and bean plants. So I've kind of made a mistake there. These are Italian purple uh, pole beans. These are fantastic, uh, but I haven't topped them yet, and they're growing into the avocado tree. This is lastinado kale. 
Uh, unfortunately, this is literally half a package of seed, and I've already thinned it once, and, and we need to just eat our way through it. We're going to be very busy this year. Now, um, the next plant, these are uh, Kentucky Blue Wonder pole beans, fantastic green bean, stringless. Um, they're prolific producers, wonderful plants. These are Japanese eggplants that are already in flower, wonderful. But I also planted from seed three and three from starts. So I want to see how they do. Um, I'm sort of climbing through my jungle. These are heirloom tomatoes, uh, a range of, of different ones. But look at the beautiful elephant ear leaves. These are basically solar conversion tools to make the plants grow. And you can see, cut it off in front, uh, I've been having a little trouble with, I planted my sunflowers in the wrong place. Now, the other thing to notice is I haven't been pruning enough. So this is an example of something you need to prune off of your tomatoes. It's a little shoot between the branching that you don't want to promote. Um, now over here, these are romaine lettuces that I planted in March from starts. And they've been growing wonderfully. And this is one place where the sunflowers are helping because they're providing a little bit of shade at the hot part of the day so that the lettuce is happier. So that's one place where the sunflower strategy worked versus on the other side of the garden. Now here are tomato or potato plants that I started and I've been worried because nothing happened and literally this start just came up this morning. So I'm excited because now I know that the potatoes are actually working. Pardon the mess in the garden. I didn't clean up before we shot. Now this is our herb garden. So you, all of these went from seeds. So you have Thai basil, green basil, Genovese basil, and I bought rosemary and parsley to augment it. Now these basils started from seed, they're Genovese. This is the third transplant I've done from little cups to larger cups now to this, and these are gifts for friends. So that's the garden this morning. Um, you can see I have some insect issues to deal with, some pruning to deal with, and some wrong plant in the wrong place to deal with. Otherwise, things are not too bad. So back to the slides. Um, so if you look at this spring to summer now, I cleaned up the garden starting March 1st. I added compost and chicken manure, manure on the same day. And my planting window was basically around, right around the shelter in place notice to around the 1st of April. I planted early in other words. And I, from seed, I planted basil and eggplant and kale and sunflowers and green beans and purple beans and zucchini and red potatoes. And from starts, I planted the romaine lettuce and the Thai basil and the tomatoes. And at the time, I refreshed all of my scaffolding and, and, and basically checked all the irrigation. So this is where we were probably by about the first week of April. All of this was in. So you can see how much has grown. Now, I normally would not have planted this early, but because of the COVID-19 shelter in place, I was worried that I wouldn't be able to get seeds or starts and then I had an accident and fell off of a porch. So I was worried that I wouldn't be able to take care of it. So I got everything in early. Um, so when you look at these, um, if your tomato plants are in, this is uh, one of my uh, sun goals actually. It's already showing fruit. Now, normally I wouldn't see fruit for another couple of weeks. So if you're wondering whether you could plant tomatoes now, the answer is yes, but do it from larger starts, not seed. Um, I'm going to feed the plants because we're now into fruit. I've been tying them up as they grow because plants, the tomatoes don't attach themselves. I'm behind on my pruning as I discussed earlier. And since we're going to fruit, I'll be turning the water down on the tomatoes. I've been watching for pests and I haven't seen any. And if we're at fruit now, I expect to be starting to harvest uh, beginning of July. 
on the beans, um, I planted the beginning of April. I haven't fed them yet. I suspect I'm going to feed in the next week or two by adding compost and maybe some additive around that, around the plants, because I may have overplanted. Uh, the only pruning I plan to do with my beans is to top the plants. Um, th this is a very dry year, and so uh, I expect to maintain the water supply on the bean plants. I haven't seen any evidence of pests yet, and I don't expect to be harvesting until probably second or third week of July. Now the lettuce is, it's been amazing. I don't know why, you get lucky. So my romaine lettuces have come in beautifully, uh, but I am starting to think I need to figure out what lettuce to plant for August, July, August, September, and put those into seed or cups now. Um, I, I don't see a need to feed these because they're doing so well, but they, they do require a lot of water and you have to keep an eye on pests. I've already seen evidence of snails in the garden that I had to deal with. And I worry about whitefly because lettuce, lo whiteflies love lettuce, but I've been harvesting and it's going very well. The zucchini, I don't know what happened here. So this is just the same zucchini I've grown in the past. And the plants are two or three times bigger than I've ever seen. I'm in flower and production already, it makes me nervous. And I haven't fed them or increased water. The only pests I've seen so far is some evidence of ants. Um, and we've already been harvesting zucchini blossoms, uh, so for fried zucchini blossoms, and we've already harvested one or two little zucchinis. That's about a month earlier than normal for me. And then the herb plant, you, this is a good photo. There, that's a picture where you can see that something's chomping on, the, on these. So I have to get out with uh, an organic um, spray for that. Uh, I've not fed these extra food at all, um, but I've kept the water up because it's been so dry. And we've already been harvesting some of our basil, which is early. So uh, before I go on, that, that's just an overview of a vegetable garden in Larkspur that was planted, I wanna say, starting probably the last week of April, first week of, last week of March, first week of April. Any questions? Franklin, any questions? So far, not yet, but I, I forgot, I was supposed to run a poll real quick. I wanted oh. to see how many people were, um, let me see if I get this to work correctly. Um, we're, we wanted to know how many of, of you in the audience were our master gardeners already or in the program and then how you, how you found out about it. So if you want to click on, if you're a master, a Marin master gardener, um, and then which news outlet you heard it from. And then if you have questions, and we did get one coming, um, someone asked, what do you mean by the top, top the plant? Ah, good point. Um, I have to get so I can see. So when it was for the beans, the picture on the right, um, one of the problems you can run into is your bean plants outgrow your scaffolding. So, and then they start to flop down and then they're climbing into the trees where I can't get to them. And so what I've tended to do is since I'm already in a raised bed that's two feet high and the scaffolding is another six. So now you're eight feet in the air. My tendency in the past has been to top the bean plants so that they don't keep growing and the energy goes into production in the plant where I can reach it. So I do the same with tomatoes. Um, it's so that you, I don't want to get up on a ladder to go work on the plants. So, um, I try to avoid that. Did that answer the question? I think so. And don't forget, you can ask questions either in the chat box or in the Q and A. 
So, and yeah, and they said, thank you, they answered it. Oh, good. Um, so I'll go back to the presentation. Um, so, but that's a good question. Um, everybody's different, um, but my experience has been that I wanna keep plants at manageable heights. So for example, on the right, these are the green and purple beans, pole beans. You can see these growing over the top. Um, shortly, all of the tomatoes will be up there growing over the top. Also, um, you have to control so the beans don't grow into the kale. Um, and so I'm just sort of always paying attention that I'm, the garden's not getting ahead of me. Um, so if there aren't any further questions, I'll keep going. Well, we've got a, a couple more just came in oh, real quick. Okay. So, um, uh, this is a more general question, but I planted beets this year and they don't seem to be doing well. Did I plant them too early? Were they from seeds or starts? If it, it, it makes a difference. I mean, for you could see my potato plants. Um, They're from starts. Yeah. Oh, from starts. Yeah. You know, it, it, I would give it another couple of weeks just to see how it's doing. Um, you know, it's a funny year and um, I'm always sort of, I have to, I always am more anxious to see the plants do stuff than maybe the plant is. So um, you have to kind of move at the plant's um, pace. So give it another couple of weeks and see where you are. Now, as an aside, uh, one year I discovered that someone who will go nameless in our two-person household was harvesting the tops of my beets thinking they were Swiss chard. Um, so you, if you're seeing your leaves disappear, I would check with whoever you're living with because that might be happening to you too. Any other questions? Yeah, and someone else does topping tomatoes lower fruit production and how do you prune zucchini? I don't know how to prune zucchini other than when the leaves start to die, you know, turn yellow, I cut them back at the base. But those monsters that you saw, I, I don't know what happened. There are five plants in there and I thought I was going to have room to put some other things in and they, I can barely walk past them now. So they, I must have done a great job on the soil this year. So I don't really prune zucchini. Um, on tomatoes and other things, when you top them, then the energy that was growing, going into creating more stock and growing up, goes out into fruit production. So that's a good thing. And then the last question is, um, I'm, a be I'm a beginner at planting vegetables. Um, how can you determine what herbs and vegetables you can plant together? And I only want to plant in containers. Ah, uh, that's coming up. So I'll handle both subjects. Okay. Oh, is that all right? So, um, to, to net this out, um, I'm off to a good start this year. I've got some evidence of insects and snails. I don't see any aphids or powdery mildew yet. Um, I am seeing a little bit of an idea that there might be some white fly. And I do have the classic master gardener problem of wrong plant, wrong place, my sunflower problem. So what I have to do hopefully starting this weekend is figure out what I'm going to do with the sunflowers that are in the wrong place. Go in and do the little pruning of the tomatoes. Make sure that things are tied up correctly. There's probably some insect spraying that needs to be done. And then to my surprise, I'm already seeing leaf drop from my lemon tree, which is all through the garden. So I need to clean that up. And I am planning to amend the soil because we're going to flower and fruit so quickly this year. So when you, that's sort of the garden in mid throw, but if you were not planted yet and you were saying, can, what can I do today or this weekend? You, you start with a, a basic set of questions. You know, what do you like to eat? What's, what can't you buy or what's expensive? And what's something that would be fun? So when you look at that, um, the vegetable world basically breaks into cool season vegetables and warm season. We're going into the hottest part of the year. So this is when you plant things like fruit things like cantaloupe, squash, tomato, watermelon. 
sweet corn, snap peas, lima beans, summer squash. And the lettuces and things like that you can do if you protect and have a cooler part of the garden. Um, the beets, um, the person who asked about the beets, it may be that where you planted them is too hot. So um, it, that may be just a placement issue. So when you look at this, here's everything. We have four vegetable seasons a year for planting. And one way to look at it is you're at the end of April, May, and you're before July, August. So you can continue to plant the things that are in the April, May column and look at things from the July, August and, and kind of look at the whole list together. My tendency personally would be to plant with starts right now because, you know, it's, it's already past June 1 and you want to not be waiting till October for things to come in. But you have this wide range of things you can choose. And by the way, this list is from Pam Pierce's Golden Gate Gardening Book, which is available in the library. And, and remind me, um, Franklin, can people now order hard copy books from the library and pick them up? Yeah, right now you can call us and we'll, we'll have books that uh, um, have them ready for you for curbside pickup. Um, we just can't put them on, on hold online yet. So you actually have to call the library to do that at the moment. So if you're trying to do garden planning right now and you wanted to get a hold of Golden Gate Gardening, the book, you could call the Larkspur Library and get a copy and, have, and then come by and pick it up. And the pickup is in the driveway of the parking lot next to the children's library entrance. Is that correct? Yes, yes. Okay. From 12 um, to four, Tuesday through Saturday. <laughs> perfect. Um, so the other way to think about the summer garden is by plant family. And the reason you wanna do this is because of this. You, you wanna be rotating plant families every year. So if you had tomatoes in one box, Last year, you don't want to plant the same tomatoes or the same um, plant family this year. So when you go back and look, um, for example, if you were replacing uh, cabbage with broccoli, that doesn't really help you. They're the same family. Or uh, peppers with tomatoes, that doesn't help you. So what you want to do is say, if I grew tomatoes in one container or, or a raised bed, last year, this year I should probably be looking at beans because it's a different family. And the reason you're doing this is it reduces pests and diseases, it improves the nutrient quality of the soil, and um, at times it's good to play also with deep-rooted vegetables versus very shallow ones and ones that are heavy feeders versus ones that aren't. So if you go back to this basic, you know, you need six hours of sunlight, good strong soil, adequate irrigation, spacing, and scaffolding. You could be looking at your garden right now and saying, it's June, and if you don't have six hours of sunlight, your vegetable garden's in the wrong place because this is the sunniest part of the year. And the time that I measure the six hours is actually in April because I want to make sure that I have a good start to my growing season. Also, you want to align your um, beds so that the long side of the bed is facing south or um, west to optimize for the day, the hottest parts of the day. Uh, if you have on the eastern side of your house an eastern bed facing east, that might be a good place for cool weather plants because you're not going to have the hot sun in the afternoon. So that's where you might plant radishes and lettuces and things. All of us have to bear in mind that if you're in ground versus raised beds versus containers, and I do all three, um, what varieties do well changes, uh, how to deal with viruses in the soil changes, how to protect against gophers changes, and what the irrigation needs are changes. So if you're growing things in ground, you can pretty much grow all varieties of all vegetables. You do have to worry about viruses, so I tend towards hybrids, which are disease resistant. 
um, I've had periods of time, I have all these gopher cages in the back that I use, but I haven't had to for a couple of years because the gophers have left me alone. But if you see gopher activity in your garden, you can use gopher cages to protect the in-ground. And in-ground uses the least water from irrigation because it's getting groundwater. If you're in raised beds, pretty much can grow everything. If you detect soil viruses, you can always replace the soil. You need gopher wire on the bottom of your raised beds, and it requires sort of an average amount of water. If it's a really big raised bed, um, it's, it's not the same as in ground because you're still not getting groundwater. Now, containers are unique, so you have to look for the varieties do, that do well in containers. You can address soil issues by replacement. You don't have the gopher problem, but your frequency of watering should be more frequent with smaller amounts. And you have to think about soil. And so um, it took me a while to figure out that actually I grow soil and the soil grows the plants. So I'm personally, I add compost and chicken manure twice a year, raised beds, February and October. This year was the beginning of March. And frankly, the vegetables are heavy feeders. So they, they consume a lot of nutrients. But the good news is, you overfill your beds, so they're brimming with compost, and then you plant three or four weeks later, once, if it's over, if it's not cured correctly, it will have cooled off a bit. And the, you'll literally see the soil drop because the, the organic material is decomposing and the plants are, are extracting the nutrients. And then when you do your harvest in the fall, you then clean up your garden, add more compost and manure, and then you're ready to do your winter crop. So this works pretty well. When you have problems is if you forget to amend your soil and you go a couple cycles and the plants have run out of nutrients, literally, or you're in containers and you haven't been adding enough nutrients and you're pouring water through and the container soil gets very old and dead. This happens a lot, by the way, with citrus trees in containers. So I'm always looking for ways to amend the soil. Um, truthfully, we should all be in 15 to 25 gallon containers because then we could grow anything we want. But the smaller the container, the more constrained you are. And the way to look at this is, uh, this is also from Pam Pierce's book, different crops have different root depths. So if you want to grow them in containers, you measure from the top of your container to the bottom. And if, for example, you have a container that's eight inches deep, then I wouldn't plant anything in the carrot, bean, or broccoli columns in that container because their root system is gonna want a bigger container deeper. Um, similarly, you can plant anything in the first column in deeper containers. So a deeper, bigger container can handle everything on this chart. The smaller, narrower, I mean, less depth container, it constrains what you can plant. A lot of us container gardeners have the containers we have. <laughs> so before you go and select plants, measure your containers and look at this chart and will basically tell you what would grow well in different size containers. Any questions about this? Because this is sort of fundamental to container gardening. Yes, yeah, so we, we have a few more. Um, so the first one is, I see that you added compost and chicken manure. What type of soil do you use? Also watering system? I'm gonna deal with watering in a minute. I, um, I keep experimenting with different composts and, um, but I try to get, um, from reputable vendors that have been um, allowed to not, they, they, well, I can't think of for some reason the term, you don't want the soil too hot. And I add chicken manure to boost it. And that may explain my zucchini. Um, my, my wife thinks I put a nuclear material in that bed because it's so huge. But the trick is, Add your compost and chicken manure if you want, 
but give it a couple weeks and water so that the soil has, has kind of integrated before you plant. Um, did that answer the question, Franklin? Well, I think so, but so um, the, the next one is I planted some little um, gem lettuce from seed and I believe three weeks ago and saw some promising growth, which then got eaten overnight. It looks like uh, the work of a quail, no evidence of snails, and any recommendations of dissuading pests from, aside from netting? Well, so I, I had a similar thing. Um, and so I did a combination of, I used um, organic snail and slug bait just in case. And then I put netting up and uh, the lettuce has done fine since then. But I had some similar problems this spring. So it was a combination of just in case snail and slug offense and then netting because the birds were hungry. Okay, so, and the next one is, um, how do you know if you have viruses in your soil? Ah, we'll, we'll handle that when we get to the integrated pest management at the end. But basically, uh, if you're seeing wilting, yellowing, um, decreased growth suddenly, then there are indicators that you might have viruses in the soil. You're more likely to have it if it's in the ground than in a container or a raised bed. But certainly, um, Marin County is famous for its profusion of three different types of viruses, and, and many of us have had to deal with that. I'll deal with it more later, but thank you. Okay, and then are coffee grounds by themselves uh, a good compost? I've heard that, but I've never used them. So I, I don't, I would, I would look it up at the Master Gardener website. Okay, and then I have two dwarf lemon and orange tree. Can I keep them in the containers? Yes, but that's a, the citrus class. You missed us by two weeks. Um, but we're doing I, it again in the future, so don't. <laughs> no, no, no. So I, I, first off, did we post that class? No, that was Sausalito, so. Oh, oh, so the Sausalito Library has a citrus class that I taught. But the question was, will dwarf orange and lemon trees go in containers? Yeah, or can I keep them in the containers? Oh, absolutely. Just make sure you continue to build the soil. And it's a longer discussion, but there's a, there's a whole class on citrus gardening at the Sausalito Library website that I gave two weeks ago. Yeah, a couple of weeks now. And then um, instead of rotating the crops, can you amend the soil annually with soil amendment, chicken manure, et cetera? Well, you should do both. If, and, and the main thing with crop rotation is you're just trying to not, if there are any diseases or insects that winter over, you're just not trying to continue to feed them the same thing year after year. So I've, I've gotten it down to, even if you have a garden that only has, like two rows, you just change what you're planting in the two rows each year, or you, you mix it up. And, and if you can't, then plant hybrids. Okay, and then any suggestions for green onions that don't seem to be growing very well? I'm trying the green onions in containers and raised beds, and neither are very happy, both from seeds. Um, hmm. Well, that's interesting. Um, so green onions theoretically are pretty shallow, so they should go in any container size. And, um, but they like, uh, they like rich soil. So I, I grew onions last winter and they did very well, but it was a rich soil of compost and chicken manure. And then I, I amended both of those with chopped up leaves from the garden. So it was sort of airy. Um, I would, I would look at maybe, um, boosting if you have a vegetable fertilizer, um, seeing if that would help them get going. Um, they are a, uh, let me go backwards. Um, green onions, um, they're, they're a cooler weather plant, but you should be able to grow them. It shouldn't be a problem. Okay, and then on the last one so far is in our garden, something is eating our squash within a week of planting our starters. How can we prevent that? And do you have any suggestions? 
Um, when we get to IPM, I'll show you how to do this. In fact, we'll get out of the presentation. I'll just go to the site. So we, we need to look at squash. Okay. I'll, I'll handle that when we get there. Is that okay? Okay. So that was the last question for now. Okay. Um, so you may have noticed in the little video that my garden is a little overgrown this year. And I think it was, I did, I got nervous because of the COVID-19 shelter in place and I had recently fallen off of a porch. So I, I'm not sure how well I was thinking about this. I appear to have overplanted, and um, I've even thinned and it's still overplanted. And so I'm going to have some things fighting with each other for space. Um, it's important that uh, you can have leaves touching each other, but they shouldn't be competing. And um, you need to lay your garden out so that you have a sense of a rhythm, which is what's coming into fruit? What am I gonna be harvesting? When will this plant come out? What will I replace it with? And if you have a big enough garden, you can do intercropping, which is between the rows, you can be starting the next crop and then it's coming up while the others are being harvested. So um, don't do what I did and, and do what I say. I would look up um, for every crop that you wanna grow, what's the spacing that you need to do um, and, and be careful because you, as you could see, clearly I've overplanted this year. Um, scaffolding is a key thing. Most of us have small areas for gardens and particularly the people who have only a deck. And so depending upon what you're growing, like beans, peas, cucumbers, and melons, or tomatoes, you can go vertically. There are, there are already climbers. And the only trick is you have to pay attention which ones do you need to tie up versus which ones can grab onto things as they go up. And really the only one that needs tying up is tomatoes. But likewise, if you're gonna plant something like sunflowers, it's important to be prepared to stake them because we have these very windy days every now and then. And you may have noticed some of my sunflowers have been blown over and I'm pulling them back up. Now the virtue of scaffolding and virtual ver vertical gardening is it way increases the yield per square foot and it takes advantage of sunlight against walls and fences that gives you more heat, which is great. Um, Irrigation, I recheck my irrigation lines probably three or four times a year. So if you've already planted and you haven't checked your irrigation, just go all the way through your vegetable garden and sort of watch where you know the connections are and make sure that everything is connected up. Because there are times where, I don't know who did this with a hoe, but they've kind of chopped through the irrigation line or it's gotten disconnected somehow and you could plant things and a couple weeks could go by before you realize they're not getting any water. So you wanna make sure that your irrigation lines are working. And then deep watering is actually the best. And, and, but deep watering means different things for in-ground versus container gardening and raised beds. So deep watering in-ground, you can basically put a lot of water out and it will go into the soil and it will go pretty deep. Um, whereas in a raised bed, there's a limit to how much water you can put on the ground before it starts running out the bottom. And then in containers, it's better to have more frequent watering for shorter durations because the container can't hold this, the water. It will run out the bottom. And the other thing to think about is, for example, Lettuces need a lot of water, and tomatoes, when you hit July, don't. So you don't want to have them getting the same amounts of water. In terms of fertilizing, I rely primarily on compost. I'm starting to explore more with fish fertilizers. But when it comes to container gardening, it's helpful, if you, if you want to try this, to use compost, put it in a five gallon container, about a third full, fill it with water and then put a top on and leave it in the sun for a day. And then you pour it out, pour, pour it through a strainer and then 
you'll have this brown liquid and that's called compost tea. And that's a fantastic way to feed anything in the garden, but particularly containers, because you're basically putting the nutrients in a liquid form in. And, uh, and you, again, be careful that you're not pouring so much on that it goes out the bottom. So before I go to harvest, were there any questions about um, scaffolding and irrigation and fertilizing in soil? No questions? Okay. So, um, about harvest. Um, the problem for a lot of us is you take your eye off the ball. I've done this many times. And all of a sudden, you have a five pound zucchini, or you have beans that are, that are yellowing and getting hard, or you have tomatoes that are splitting. So I personally go and walk through the garden every day, starting a couple of days ago, because I found some zucchini, I've been already harvesting the lettuce, and I expect it, and my herbs are coming in. And just stay on top of, and you, you kind of have in your head when you expect things to ripen, but the reality is ignore the schedule in your head look at the plants. If you're looking at the plants and paying attention, you're going to hit a point in the next couple of weeks where something's going to be harvesting almost every day in the garden. And it's wonderful. You know, and the trick is harvest and eat or harvest and give away. But most of the vegetable garden, you want to keep moving forward because it's the more you stay on top of harvest, frankly, the more energy that goes into new fruit and new production versus, you know, more into what's already ready to be harvested. So I, I, I know some people have a master calendar in their minds and when did we plant and here's how many weeks and here's when it should be ready to harvest. That's good, but starting about now, you should be looking at everything once a day, every other day, and looking to see where are we and how soon is it to harvest. And, and you might be surprised like I am. I've got tomatoes that are a month early and I have zucchini that's frankly a month early. The herbs are coming in strong. Um, and the lettuce has been, I've been harvesting lettuce for a month. So whatever your schedule was in your head, pay attention to your garden. That'll tell you what to harvest and when. Now, it wouldn't be a gardening class without talking about weeds. Um, we have a few questions come oh, in though too. So, yeah. so um, I planted beans, uh, my beans in a container and used a tomato cage instead of scaffolding. Um, they don't seem to be climbing yet. How do I encourage that? Um, honestly, I had the same problem with my scarlet runners and I had to sort of encourage them by kind of wrapping them around the posts of those, um, um, whatever they call those things, anyway, the vertical structures. And then uh, some years I've even gone so far as to use a little bit of string to tie them to get them going. Because there have been years that the, the beans want to go around the ground more than go up. But make sure that you bought pole beans and not bush beans, and you, sh you should be able to get them growing up. Okay, and then um, how can you use compost tea? Oh, how or how often? Well, oh yeah, how often can you use compost right. tea? Um, it's interesting because I have friends who, who have extensive container gardens on their deck. And basically, once they get to mid, you know, the plants are established and they're growing well. And I suspect that they're using compost tea all year. I, I, I just, their gardens look so lush. So there's no harm in, in making that how you water. But if not, you know, every other week, every month would be fine. Just watch your plants and see if they're looking like they need some feeding. Um, someone's asking, what is compost tea? Compost tea is where you get a container 
you put a, a third of the depth of the container with compost, then you pour water in, cover it, leave it in the sun all day, and then the next day, take the lid off, do not inhale, it smells, uh, pour through a strainer, and then you'll have a brown liquid, tea, that you can then pour on plants, and you're basically, you've captured the nutrients in the compost, and you can now just, rather than trying to add compost to containers, which is hard, you use the water to water the plants, and it's delivering the nutrients from the compost. Okay, and then what, roughly what percent of chicken manure to compost? Oh, that's a really good question. Very little. Um, gosh, I hate, I hate to sound like my Italian father-in-law, just enough. Um, <laughs> no, it's like a, a small bag of chicken manure across three or four containers, or three or four raised beds. I'm just, it may be just a neurotic impulse, maybe one to six, one to eight, something like that. Very, but you're just kind of boosting the compost a little bit. Also, worm casings would do wonderfully too. Okay, and then we have, um, I always let eggplants go too long because they seem small. How often, um, how do you know when eggplant is um, ready despite its size? Oh, it's a good question. So uh, I tried to grow bigger eggplants and I don't have enough heat here and I'm not patient. So I grow Japanese eggplants, which are smaller, longer round things. And um, basically it, it's, it, you get a sense of the, how they feel and how long they are and, and whether that, and if you're hungry, I mean, I'm, I, it's like, what do we want to grill tonight? An eggplant in the summer is fantastic. So I'm, I'm never over, I never let it go too long. I, I'm probably err in the other direction. Okay, and then can you add a small amount of chicken manure to your compost tea? Um, I wouldn't, but try it and see how it does. Okay, that looks like the last of the questions for now, so. Okay, so about weeds. Um, Basically, the definition of a weed is a plant that grows somewhere that you don't want it to. And it's a plant that germinates faster and grows faster and goes to seed faster than everything around it. And all of us have weed problems of varying degrees. And so the key is, if you see a weed getting started in your vegetable garden, pull it immediately. The sooner you remove it, the better because you and get the roots, because what you don't want to do is have it go to seed, and now all of a sudden, the whole garden's full of whatever. So I'm walking through the garden all the time, pulling weeds, because um, I don't know where they come from, but we have a lot of weeds in the air here. Um, you can use mulch for weed control. I don't personally in the vegetable garden, because I'm in and out of the garden so much, uh, but in the regular garden, I use mulch but I'm still weeding constantly because there just seems to be an awful lot of weeds um, that get opportunistically uh, started in our yard. If you don't stay on top of weeding, they're competing with what you're trying to grow and it can impact production by as much as 30% having weeds going in the same garden as your vegetables. Um, so pests. Um, if you have a problem, you should Google UC Davis IPM, Integrated Pest Management. And let me just um, take us there, um, if that's okay. Um, That's the wrong screen, wrong screen. I'm sorry, I cannot see my screen. Oh, here it is. Now then, um, IPM, this, your tax dollars to pay for this. So this is, if you go to UC Davis IPM, um, which is this site, 
And this is the quadrant here, home garden turf. And let's say that you're concerned about your vegetables. And let's say you're worried about squash. So this is everything UC Davis sees going on with squash in the state of California. Invertebrates, diseases, environmental disorders, vertebrates, and weeds. So for example, um, every year I fight powdery mildew on um, my zucchini. And this is literally exactly what it looks like. It's this um, disease that, um, oh, this is downy mildew, sorry, powdery mildew. This is what I fight. And so you can go in, you see this on your leaves, you go to the IPM website, and uh, in this case, I use copper sulfate, but the site will tell you how to fight that disease. And so what you do is if you have a problem in the garden, and let's say you're seeing, um, you see leaves that have this, they look like they've been, something's inside the leaf. Well, you would go here and click until you found it. It's called a leaf miner. It tells you how to identify them and what their life cycle is, how much damage they do, and what are the solutions. In this case, it's clip off and remove the infested leaves um, or plant disease resistant species. Um, this site's invaluable because before you ever go to a nursery to ask about something, you should come here and see what's going on. Now, for example, someone asked about um, diseases. So if you have tomato plants that are starting to show this yellowing on the leaf um, that slowly spreads and then you see it, the plants are dying, fusarium wilt and verticillium wilt are soil-based viruses that attack the vascular system of a plant. So when you, if you were to do a post-mortem on a plant, you'd see its vascular system is dead on the inside. So the only solution to these kinds of viruses is either replace the soil or plant disease-resistant hybrids. And in the case of Fusarium wilt, that would be uh, hybrids that you can see at the garden have the letters F or FF listed after their name. So this is literally everything that you can find wrong in your garden, somebody else has already been through. So um, this gives you all the things that happen in the garden. Um, for example, in tomatoes, sun scald from over pruning, um, all of these different diseases. Example, aphids, how to get rid of them. The easiest way is with a hose, believe it or not. Um, so every gardener should bookmark UC Davis IPM because this is the best resource you're ever gonna find. It's free, you've already paid for it. And it applies not just to vegetables, but everything in the garden, everything you're growing, it can tell you, but what I do personally is I bring in a sample of the problem and then I click through the pictures till I find something that matches it because I'm lousy at uh, disease identification. And so this is a huge resource everybody should be using. Any questions about this before I leave this page? No? Well, okay. let, let's give it a second so people could type, so. <laughs> oh, all right. Okay. Yeah, nothing's coming in yet, Joe, so. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll keep going. Um, so, um, so the key to pest management is just go walk through the garden every day, if possible. And you're, what you're looking for are changes 
and signs of disease. Leaf curl, spots, holes, um, critters climbing on something. And the most important thing is to, to identify the problem and act quickly because you don't want the problem to spread. And classic examples are aphids, um, white fly, uh, um, powdery mildew can take out not just the crop that it starts in, but it can jump crops within your garden. So if you see these things, go to IPM, look up, find what you think it is, and then do what the IPM website tells you to fix it. So um, in the time we have left, I mean, the, the net of this is, it's the beginning of June, and some of you, like me, got nervous and planted early, and some of you haven't yet. There's still time to plant a great vegetable garden for the summer, or to fix the problems that you already started. If you're like me and you planted all of your sunflowers on the wrong side of your beds, or if you planted something and too much of it's come in, there's plenty of time to adjust and still have a wonderful vegetable garden for the summer that you can uh, live out of uh, all summer and into the fall. So um, I wanna thank you all for coming and ask if there are any final questions uh, from Franklin and then let you know now next week, um, is it Marie Narlock? Yeah, Marie Narlock with uh, for Fire, um, Fire Smart um, Landscaping. So. And now she's going to be very specific about things you can do. It's sort of a how-to class, and she's wonderful uh, class. And then the class after her is? It's, um, in, organic fertilizing. And, and here again, um, feeding your vegetable crop and your garden is key, and there are ways to do it that won't end up in the water system. And Jane is great at that class. So uh, I hope you've enjoyed this class. Are there any final questions? So, so we did have a question. Um, I, so thank you for being here, Renee. Um, there, I'm in Nevada, and would this website also help me? And I, it's the, um, the IPM, would that help her? I think um, I would check first with uh, the University of Nevada. Um, I would Google University of Nevada Integrated Pest Management to see if they have one for Nevada. Um, because the list of diseases and critters might be different for Nevada than it is here. Um, but if not, this is better than nothing. And how in the heck did you find us from Nevada? That's amazing. So, and then um, the next one is, uh, what are some good options for mulching containers? Oh, so if you're in a cool climate, uh, stone is a good one, actually. It, because you put the stone at the top of the planter or the uh, container and it absorbs heat, so it keeps heat in the container and it also reflects sunlight, so it helps you get more light on your plants. That's for cool climates. For warmer climates, um, regular, um, was this mulch or compost? I'm sorry. It was a mulching, mulching for mulch. Yeah. And so, um, and then for uh, the rest of the garden, rest of the climates, um, stone may not be helpful because it's kind of hot, but you can use, um, a, a, there's a wide range of mulches that work well in vegetable gardens. I would go look in Pam Pierce's book or at the UC Master Gardener website. Okay, and then someone asked, can you show again how to pr prune tomato shoots? Oh. Um, well, that was a video, but here, um, give me a second. Um, right, so if you see in this picture above the tomato, there's an elbow, a branch coming out, and then the main stalk of the tomato plant. If you're seeing little starting little growth between the branch and the main stalk. You just pinch those off. And then topping the plant, I do a diagonal cut on an angle so that the 
if it rains, the water will run off. But I try and top them. I, my plants are already two feet in the air because they're in raised beds. So I stop them at the top of the um, scaffolding, which is six feet, because now you're eight feet in the air and I don't really want things taller than that. So I just clip at the top and tie the plant off up there so that it's secure at the top. Um, because if you haven't secured your tomato plants and they get a lot of growth up there, they can fall in on themselves because there's nothing holding them up. Um, the other thing to pay attention to is that your scaffolding has some stakes in the ground. I wonder if I have a picture of that. Um, right, on the left, you see the tomato plant. Uh, see the green stakes next to the scaffolding? Those go three feet into the ground so that the scaffolding is tied to them. And so when it's windy, the scaffolding won't blow over because I've had that happen and that's discouraging. Other questions, Franklin? So there, um, someone has, do you prepare your own compost? And um, the second follow-up was, do you ever use a tumbler composter? No, I don't. I, I uh, mainly purchase it and I use the green bin to get stuff out of the garden, um, but I'm a rabid user of compost, but I'm not a producer. But we have great compost class. And I'm thinking, is that one of our classes that's scheduled, Franklin? I think we, we have that scheduled down the line. So, yes, so there's a compost class coming. And Joan Irwin is a genius at composting. So keep an eye on the Larkspur website, because when Joan is talking about compost, everyone should listen. She's a great class teacher. So Renee from Nevada, um, it was recommended by her garden club, and she found us through Eventbrite. <laughs> wow. So, and then someone asked, can miracle Grow planting soil be used in pots to grow tomatoes? Yes. If it's the outdoor soil, yes. Okay, that looks like the, the last of the questions for now. Um, well, I want to thank you all. Um, I hope this has been helpful. Um, that it's going to be a possibly very hot, dry summer. So stay on top of your irrigation needs and keep an eye out for critters and insects and diseases. But I'm a lucky gardener. Um, lettuce is in, basil's doing well, zucchini's coming along. You're going to do the same and better. So I hope you have a wonderful summer and enjoy living out of your garden. Thank you so much for joining us today. And then um, to keep, keep an eye on your email, everybody. Um, I'll be sending out a survey from the UC Master Gardeners. So for those of you who are attending the workshop for credit, make sure you fill the survey out. We'll also be sending out a link for um, the, the recording so you can watch it again later. And then um, also we'll have include the events that are coming up. So join us again next week with um, Marie Narlock for Fire, um, Fire Smart Landscaping. Um, and I hope you guys all have a great weekend. So thank you for joining us and we'll see you next time. Franklin, thank you so much for having us. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.